So the Sydney Martin Lecture is named such um, after a 20th century Nazarene pastor. Reverend Dr. Sydney Martin was born on the 23rd of October 1910 in Sacriston in County Durham into a Methodist family. Uh, he was a minister who had a significant influence on the city of Glasgow in the 1950s and 60s as he was minister at the time at the Sharp Memorial Church in Parkhead. Uh, he was there for 25 years. And he was passionate about preaching and it was rumoured that he spent 26 hours a week preparing to preach two sermons every Sunday, about 30 minutes each, plus a Wednesday evening meditation at the church prayer meeting. He lectured here at NTC from time to time in pastoral theology and the study desks in our library were given to the college in his memory. Uh, he died in 2004 and now we have a Sydney Martin lecture each year um, in memory of him and this always has a practical and social theology theme to it to reflect the ministry of Sydney Martin. And this year we're honoured to have uh, Dr Eric Stoddart, also, who's also from Scotland, um, to NTC to give the Sydney Martin Lecture 2019. Dr Stoddart is lecturer at the University um, of St Andrews in the School of Divinity and he's been there for 14 years. Um, Dr Stoddart was a Baptist minister for a number of years but is now um, a lay member of a Scottish Episcopal Anglo-Catholic Church. Um, before becoming a lecturer at St Andrews, Dr Stoddart was involved in the Scottish Church's Open College, an ecumenical distance learning college. Uh, and Dr Stoddart is a practical theologian with specific research interest in surveillance and digital technologies. And he says, in a nutshell, I'm curious about the faith which our societies place in technologies as supposed solutions to relationship challenges across a whole host of levels and in a multitude of contexts. With a colleague, Dr. Stoddart is currently developing a surveillance and religion research network, and he has numerous publications and is currently working on a book due to be published next year, which is entitled The Common Gaze, Surveillance and the Common Good. So we look forward to that, and we look forward to, to this lecture this evening, keeping an eye on surveillance. So please welcome Dr. Eric Stoddart. Thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome, and it is an honour to be here, to be able to deliver this lecture this evening. It's Christmas Day in the year 800. In St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, Pope Leo III crowns Charlemagne Holy Roman Emperor. And I hope that one of the myths about that day actually is true. The myth is that this particular prayer composed for the occasion formed part of the coronation liturgy. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. It would serve as a none too subtle subversion of the emperor's aspirations on his coronation day. This prayer would have reminded him that even he, the Holy Roman Emperor, is under the watchful gaze of one more powerful. And this prayer has been carried down through the centuries as part of many Eucharistic liturgies and is prayed in churches today by the whole people of God, not merely reserved as it was at one time to the priest preparing to celebrate the Mass. I do wonder if this ancient prayer might not have a place in the Human Resources Handbook for inducting new employees at GCHQ, <laughs> or perhaps at the CIA in Langley, Virginia. 
Christians believe, you see, as we know, in God's watchful, loving gaze. And how might this faith claim help us to engage critically with the everyday surveillance technologies of life in 2019? In other words, what biblical and theological resources might we find that will enable us to play our part in keeping an eye on God? I'm going to introduce 21st century surveillance mostly by considering how we encounter, deploy, cooperate, resist in everyday life. And in that light, I'm going to briefly outline my fundamental proposal that we talk of surveillance from the cross. I'll then back up a little bit and talk about where we find surveillance in the Bible. But that only takes us so far. Between, there's a huge gap between the ancient world and the 21st century technological world. And to bridge that gap, I'm going to use the idea of how we manage how we are visible or less visible or invisible in different social settings. That's going to let me return to the Bible to identify that practice of being more or less visible. And on that basis, I'm going to suggest some implications for a Christian response, how Christians might contribute to keeping an eye on surveillance. Understanding 21st century surveillance, some definitions. It's possible to define surveillance purely negatively as simply practices of domination. And this would make it only about negative strategies of control. But on the other hand, we can think of surveillance as both good and bad, sometimes both good and bad at the very same time. So sociologist and Christian David Lyon suggests that surveillance is any systematic and routine attention to personal details, whether specific or aggregate, for a defined purpose. Lyon goes on to say that purpose, the intention of the surveillance practice, may be to protect, may be to understand, to care for, to ensure entitlement, control, manage or influence individuals or groups. Now I prefer the positive and negative possibilities of Lyon's definition rather than the purely negative because I think Lyon's definition captures the potential for surveillance to enhance human flourishing, albeit with some very careful, critical considerations. Now, the sites of surveillance are numerous. Rattle off a long list, including military intelligence, state administration, work monitoring, policing, crime control, consumer activity. We could add to that list domestic and friendship contexts, as well as civil society, maybe religion, but also education and trade unions. The means of surveillance include CCTV, satellite imaging, number plate recognition, customer data management, social media, the internet of things, smart TVs, smart fridges, smart kettles, even saw a smart toothbrush the other day. Mobile communications, whether they're phones or tablets, statistical analysis of data, maybe in healthcare, and predictive algorithms like you see on Amazon or Facebook. But where do we encounter surveillance? Veterans of the armed forces will be all too familiar with the concept of military intelligence. Engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, relied heavily on advanced surveillance technologies. Villages are targeted by British or Allied bombers using sophisticated satellite imaging surveillance. At a mundane level, most of us will have benefited from the surveillance technologies related to paying our car tax or maybe some other municipal tax. Such state administration relies heavily on the collection, analysis, and then the dissemination of information it attempts to influence our behavior. For example, why else have governments at various points 
invested in such things as a national childhood obesity database or a young offender assessment system. Surveillance in the workplace is a feature we probably welcome, especially for its rigorous monitoring of the flying hours of airline pilots. CCTV is one of the most, if not the most, visible form of contemporary surveillance. Online shopping, tracked by cookies, has brought its convenience as well as its irritations. Targeted adverts, picking up on the products that we have viewed on totally unrelated websites, demonstrates the value of our data to commercial companies. And surveillance technologies are part of our life amongst family and friends. We're presented with computer monitoring software to protect our children. Our elderly parent may benefit from managed alerts within their care home or activated through GPS technologies should their dementia leave them lost when out for a walk. Churches may now be places where we find ourselves not only under CCTV surveillance, but our membership record, our giving, our participation might be recorded and analysed through software packages. Where do we deploy surveillance? Well, if you're a teacher, you spend hours inputting assessment data on your pupils or your students. When you're doing that, you are deploying a surveillance technology. You're gathering personal data, you're contributing to its processing with a view to influencing the outcome of your students. You're a surveillance agent. As a manager in a retail store, you're using surveillance not only over your customers, but to discourage and capture staff threats. Th theft, rather. Staff taking things out of the storeroom, staff taking money out of the tills. If you're a civil servant working perhaps in the Department of Work and Pensions, you are a surveillance agent. You're making extensive use of surveillance technologies to assign welfare benefits and to sanction recipients. As a parent, you may well be a surveillance agent too. You may have the capacity and make the decision to track your children using their mobile phone data. Some of the deployment of surveillance is part and parcel of our regular working responsibilities but we're also quite willing participants in other forms of monitoring. So here, where are we cooperating with surveillance? Now, any user of Facebook or other social media is willingly participating in surveillance. We're surrendering much personal data, not only to Facebook, in order that the corporation might raise revenue through advertising, but we're surrendering data to our friends. We're actively engaging in peer surveillance. Now, this reaches absurd levels at times, seeing how many miles a friend has run that evening, or the route he's covered on his bike, perhaps cements our friendship, and it might leave us le thinking just a little less sanguinely about our own sedentary lifestyle. Peer pressure through social networking sites can have considerable negative effects particularly on young women already struggling with body image. The pressure comes in this case not only from advertisers, but from their so-called friends, who are actually perhaps a bully from school. So we deploy surveillance, we cooperate with surveillance, we are involved in resistance towards surveillance. Where we resist surveillance really depends on our social setting. As consumers, we may make a choice to not have the special discounts that are available through a John Lewis or a Marks and Spencer's customer loyalty card. We may say, no, thank you, I don't want the card, I don't want to surrender my data, so we lose out on some of those discounts. And we may well be resisting surveillance when we have that old Tesco card that we haven't used for ages and we lie at the checkout where the machine or the person on the checkout says, have you got a Tesco card? Have you got a Sparks card? We know we've got one in the drawer that's still active, but we say no. Is that a permissible Christian lie? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. 
but it's part of our resistance to surveillance. In an attempt to purchase a surprise present for our partner, we may take particular care to clear the cookies from our web searches. That may look to some people suspicious activity, but it's so we can buy them a birthday present and they don't know what it is they were going to buy them. Some of us might use encryption software to hide the content of our email correspondence, either from illegal hacking or from state monitoring. So there are lots of ways in which we deploy, we cooperate, we resist surveillance. Let me make the key claim. Surveillance becomes unremarkable to us because our acceptance of it leaks out all over the place. Surveillance is liquid. Surveillance and our attitudes to it leak all over. We encounter surveillance in multiple, often overlapping areas of everyday life. Our mobile communications, our internet traffic, our movements in public spaces, our very bodies at airports, they're all sites of surveillance. As professionals, as friends, we use surveillance strategies. Although in most cases, we probably don't categorize that as surveillance. We're submerged in surveillance. We cooperate with surveillance in democratic societies, usually quite willingly, if not a tad naively. Yet we do resist surveillance. And that's not simply reserved to the political activist. We do make choices. We withhold our personal information. We sometimes disguise our digital presence. But surveillance is a cultural practice. It's not just technologies. We're now in a culture of what Zygmunt Bauman calls liquid surveillance. Surveillance is fluid. It's flowing from one area of life into another. Bauman, the veteran sociologist who developed the notion of liquid modernity, which he's transferred into liquid surveillance, has been in conversation with surveillance studies expert David Lyon to unpack this idea of liquid surveillance. And by this, they mean our blithe or ready acceptance of surveillance in one area makes us more ready, it naturalizes us to accept, even to expect surveillance in another aspect of life. So feeling sufficiently comfortable about personal data being scooped up for convenient online shopping, we're rendered more amenable to, we perhaps scarcely even notice the collecting of mobile communications data by the state. So in a very mundane everyday area, we get accused to surveillance, we don't even notice it in other areas of life. It's become liquid. Our acceptance of it leaks all over the place. And surveillance is tricky and elusive because it's generally two-faced. It's good and bad, both at exactly the same time. It enables and it constrains, says David Lyon. It involves control and care. It's not to say that the face of control negates the face of care or vice versa. Both practices of surveillance exist as care and control, enabling and constraining at precisely the same time, often in the same digital systems. For example, civil servants in the tax office do care about providing a convenient, accessible process for the collection of the taxes that on the whole contribute to the common good. Yet, whilst there are those who legally avoid tax by complex planning, there are those who take illegal steps to evade tax. So the digital systems are designed to limit avoidance and detect evasion, but they're also enabling us to give and surrender our taxes for the common good. It would seem to be about control, but tackling tax evasion is an active and clear statement to the majority of people who make the required contributions that we care about people get, making their fair and necessary tax payments. So, surveillance system, tax, it operates as care and control at the very same time. 
That's putting out for you a very wide-ranging picture of different sites of surveillance, different types of surveillance technologies, different aspects of the culture of surveillance. Let me come briefly to my fundamental proposal about a theological response to surveillance. I want to think about surveillance from the cross. I'll briefly outline this and then backtrack and build back up towards it. In a nutshell, when I talk about surveillance on the cross, I mean to argue that thinking theologically about surveillance involves a significant paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift from those images that readily suggest dominating power to ones that point towards care. This requires turning our conceptual paradigm of God's surveillance of us through 90 degrees. Rather than the familiar vertical surveillance from heaven, the sort of thing pictured in the great basilicas and cathedrals of Europe, Christ in glory in the apse of the cathedral looking down, that familiar vertical surveillance from heaven. I think we need to think of surveillance from the cross. Here Christ, one who knew what it was to be under surveillance himself, is in solidarity with all those who are unjustly treated, marginalized, and oppressed by surveillance. It is his solidarity that is our solidarity with those for whom surveillance is both disproportionate and unjust. Now this phrase, surveillance on the cross, often meets with bewilderment. So I'm going to unpack it just a little bit and then, as I say, approach it again from another direction. The cross is not only something that happened to Jesus. Rather, that he was executed, I think, is revelatory of his nature. His character, his nature, is that of one who surrenders to others' barbarity. He is being who he is when he lets himself be captured in the garden and taken eventually to Golgotha. It's in this sense that I think we can speak of Christ keeping us under surveillance from the cross. It's not to say that in those fateful hours he had omniscient knowledge of all our actions. Neither was he gathering information about us from across time and space. That's too literal an approach to what I'm suggesting. Rather, it is the Christ of the cross whose nature was demonstrated to us on the cross. It is that Christ who keeps us under surveillance. It's helpful to talk of Christ keeping us under surveillance from the cross because it's a metaphorical way of expressing something even more profound. It's to say something about the character or the qualities of that person undertaking surveillance. It is Christ, the identifier with us, the one in solidarity with us, who is the one who keeps us under surveillance. Let me now turn to various biblical perspectives, first on surveillance and then on invisibility, and that's going to let me come back to say a little bit more about this idea of surveillance from the cross. Let me think about surveillance in the Hebrew Bible. Espionage in the Hebrew Bible. Some great stories about espionage in the Old Testament. And God is thoroughly implicated in the practice of espionage. It is God who tells Moses in Numbers 13 to send men to spy out the land of Canaan. These spies are to engage in surveillance to establish the strength of the people living in the hill country. To quote from Numbers, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there is wood in it or not. As we might expect, other ancient Israelite leaders sent out spy missions. Just to mention one, Joshua, in Joshua 2, sends two men secretly from Shittim as spies. So there's spying in the Hebrew Bible. There is administration surveillance in the Hebrew Bible. 
In the United Kingdom, we have trades standard, trading standards officers who are employed by local councils to, amongst other responsibilities, keep an eye on rogue traders who might be using scales that are being deliberately adjusted in their favour. Such tactics, trading standards officers, are long-standing. Proverb 20, verse 10. Diverse weights and diverse measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. The people of that time knew about rogue traders too. False balances of a trader. That's part of the indictment against Judah in Hosea chapter 12. And there's a similar criticism in Amos chapter 8. So we've got espionage, we've got administration, we've got weights and measures, we've got censuses. To take a census is not a neutral arithmetical task, but it's a political action. A leader wants to know not only the amount, but often the characteristics of the population in order to plan for resources, but also to influence behavior. It becomes particularly acute when there's inter-ethnic tension. And the book of Numbers, particularly chapter 1, is a good example of a census. It's a form of surveillance, gathering data with a view to influencing people's behavior. Counting can be directed towards a particular category, for example, of foreigners in 2 Chronicles 2. Then Solomon took a census of all the aliens who were residing in the land of Israel after the census that his father David had taken and they were found to be 153,600. There's also the counting of families returning from exile that's linked to registration and purity of genealogies in Ezra chapter 2. So we've got censuses, we've got counting of people with various political and ethnic agendas. Still within administration in the Hebrew Bible, we've got policing and crime control. Now there were not bobbies on the beat in the Hebrew Bible, but I think we can find various surveillance strategies, maybe not technologies, under that heading. There are watchmen over city walls, and also metaphorically over the moral and spiritual condition of the nation. Ezekiel 33, for example. And in Isaiah 62, there are sentinels who are set. The role of the sentinels or the watchmen is to police the boundaries of the city and to alert people where there is danger it's the equivalent, in a sense, to 21st century urban surveillance. Sentinels are not necessarily gathering information or seeking to modify people's behavior, although such watchmen in that time are policing who may come in and who may not come in and go through the city gate, especially at night. But still within administration, there's the whole cultic system in the Hebrew Bible. In some respects, the world of detailed regulations over food that may be or may not be eaten, what food may be cooked with or must not be cooked with other food, and fibers that may be worn or not be mixed, seems very far removed from many of our everyday lives, and maybe a bit removed from 21st century surveillance. However, anyone with a nut allergy or who shares a home with someone who does knows for very good reasons the importance of regulating food purchases and preparation. What I think we can say, at least in the cult, the religious observances of ancient Israel, there were systems of surveillance. There were people watching who ate, who cooked, in what particular ways. In the home, there were systems of peer surveillance over how you followed the covenant regulations for the clean and the unclean food. And in the workplace, there was administrative surveillance. What clearer example could there be than that over the Hebrew slaves in Egypt? The Egyptian taskmasters are eking out every last ounce of energy from their Hebrew slaves. To quote Exodus 2, And the people of Israel groaned under their bondage, cried out for help, and their cry under bondage came up to God, and God saw the people of Israel, and God knew their condition. The consequence of complaining and requesting a three-day break in which to go into the wilderness to worship God is that the slaves are no longer provided with straw. They have to collect the straw themselves, but they still have to deliver the same number of bricks as before. They're subject to ever more intense workplace 
surveillance. So we've got administrative surveillance in the Hebrew Bible. But we can also talk of God's watching, maybe God's surveillance even. I don't think we find a doctrine of God's divine omniscience expounded in the Hebrew Bible. That's not how those texts work. What we do have are insights into how people of faith expressed their belief that God is watching them. I think we can legitimately bracket some of those under the notion of God practicing surveillance. Let me demonstrate with just maybe one or two examples. The prophet Malachi imagines a book of remembrance being written before God. Into that book are inscribed the names of those who, Malachi 3, feared the Lord and thought on his name. Now do remember that the epithet surveillance is simply something I'm using descriptively. There's no moral value imputed by terming an action as surveillance. To do so, that merely begins a process of critical inquiry of which we can get into later ethical discussion. But to call something surveillance is not to say it's good or to say it's bad, it's just to say it's surveillance. So the notion of God watching over the people, God practicing surveillance over his people, is fundamental to the dedicatory prayer offered by Solomon in the narrative of the history of the Jerusalem temple. To quote 1 Kings 8, regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays towards this place. Attention to people's supplications is expressed in what we might call God's surveillance of his temple. God's watching is a listening. It's a monitoring of prayers that in this form of spirituality are given a particular localized intensity in a building. To put it another way, it's God's surveillance as an act of care. So there's just a few examples of where I think there's surveillance in the Hebrew Bible. Let's think of surveillance in the New Testament using some of the same headings. We can think of administrative surveillance in the New Testament. Caesar Augustus decreed what would become the most well-known act of administrative surveillance, perhaps, in human history. How many bureaucrats have been jealous of him for getting his registration of people retold in public celebrations once a year for every 2,000 years? It's pretty good for an administrator. We find tax collectors at various points in the Gospels not least where those collecting the half-shekel tax in Capernaum quiz Peter about Jesus' tax affairs in Matthew 17. The tax collectors rely on a system of surveillance to administer the payments. Similarly, the priests are responsible for monitoring the health of the community. It's to them that Jesus sends a man whom he has healed of leprosy. The man is to have his healing validated. He's to make a ritual offering as part of the regular cult. There's peer surveillance in the New Testament. We can think about the early Christian communities. In the book of Acts, we find them holding all property and possessions in common to be distributed as any had need. I don't think we can establish the extent to which this is a system that's organized and how much it was actually spontaneous. But we, I think, can reasonably assume some surveillance of individuals' finances and business transactions, even if it's quite informal. The Apostle Peter is able to confront both Ananias and Sapphira, who are found to be duplicitous and die of shock. The rest of the church gets the message, and according to Acts, this terrifies outsiders who hear of it. There's a certain form of peer surveillance in certain parts of the book of Acts. Some might find more than that and more than a little oppressive, But there's another side to peer surveillance in the early church. Monitoring one another enables needs to be met, specifically for equity of treatment for Hellenist widows, vis-a-vis their Hebrew counterparts in Acts chapter 6. It's interesting that it's a failure of mutual watching that causes the problem. The Hellenist widows are going destitute. 
but it's also peer surveillance that acknowledges the situation so that it can be addressed. Here's a paradox of surveillance that I was hinting at a little bit earlier. More surveillance might be required to establish and to ensure equitable surveillance. Might actually need more surveillance to ensure equitable surveillance. Furthermore, to not be under peer surveillance might well be to your disadvantage. You might be disadvantaged by not being under surveillance. Still though, in the New Testament, we've got surveillance by community leaders. The Pharisees watch Jesus, keeping what for them is bad company in Matthew 9. He's observed eating with sinners in Mark 2. The Pharisees pay particular attention to what's happening on the Sabbath. They spot Jesus' disciples plucking some heads of grain as they walk through a field. And the Pharisees see Jesus heal on the Sabbath. There's an implication, I think, of Jesus being under continual observation when he is daily in the temple. But quite a specific claim in Luke 20 that the chief priests and scribes sent spies to keep him under covert surveillance. It's covert, or at least it's attempting to be covert, because these spies are to pretend to be sincere and thereby inveigle their way into Jesus' circle. The purpose of such espionage is to catch Jesus saying something by which the chief priests and scribes can move against him. Luke chapter 11. The Pharisees too speak, seek to accuse Jesus of breaking the Jewish law with scheming that is typical of the spying industry and is anything but dispassionate. Luke 6 tells us they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Even more explicitly, Matthew's Gospel presents the Pharisees as trying to find ways to destroy him. Matthew 12. So the surveillance and administration by community leaders, the surveillance by Jesus. The power one holds over others when practicing surveillance means it's important that we think about how Jesus himself was perhaps practicing surveillance. It comes to the fore in the way the Gospels present Jesus having the capacity to read people more than is naturally possible. He knows people's thoughts, Matthew 9. The woman at the well is confronted by Jesus with truths about herself that he can only know by supernatural means. In the Johannine I am sayings about his being bread of life, Jesus is sensing that his disciples are finding it a difficult concept. When Jesus' acuity is supplemented by divinely inspired knowledge, when that's happening, when it's natural knowledge, that needn't trouble us here. But what we have is a figure whose interactions with people are radically different to those between everyone else. Jesus is presented in the Gospels as one capable of the most intrusive surveillance imaginable, knowing what others are thinking. But the surveillance also in the New Testament by God the Father. God's watching to console. This is explicit in Jesus' teaching that the Father sees a person praying in secret. God's watchfulness is more implicitly stated for the situation of imprisoned disciples in Matthew 10. Jesus presents an overarching vision of God in terms of God not forgetting sparrows. Looking into the future to the age to come of heavenly rewards, Jesus consoles those who are anxious about what persecutions might involve. God will reward those who have given up family and lands for the gospel. That God sees keeps the persecuted under surveillance. And that's intended to be comforting, consoling for those who are called to endure privations for the sake of the gospel. So we have lots of different forms of surveillance, of watching in the Hebrew Bible, in the New Testament, but that's a long way away from the world in which you and I live in the 21st century. How can we bridge the gap between that world and our world? The gap I want to suggest is this idea of invisibility. Visibility is a social process. We see things and we're being seen and how we are seen and who we see, it's all intimately connected. 
We can be, if we're a particularly marginalised group, perhaps, say, asylum seekers, we can be pushed down below a fair level of visibility. We can be made invisible by being moved out into remote peripheral housing estates while we're waiting for our asylum claim. But yet, at the very same time, we're made hyper-visible because the stories of asylum seekers are presented in tabloid newspapers. Political language is used about asylum seekers and then eventually refugees as being strangers. Pro processes of media representation make people seeking asylum and refuge to be highly visible, but yet at the same time, we put them in physical places so that they're not visible. That can be true of lots of other different categories of people. It can be true about ourselves. We know how to navigate how we make ourselves visible in social space. We can be that bit more visible to people that we want to see us. We can do that in our conversations. We can do it with the places that we meet. We meet other people. But at other times, we can lower our threshold of visibility. We can sort of just merge into the background. We can be the wallflower at a party. We, we're actually quite adept and managing how we are visible and invisible. But it's not just something that we do. It's something that is done towards us. Our invisibility is managed by others. The skill of managing our visibility in particular contexts is very much how we practice public life and social life. If you think of what you may or may not do in terms of social media, you will be posting certain pictures of yourself, choosing to control, as far as you can, your visibility in social media. You may choose not to have a social media profile. You may be quite adept at managing your social media profile. You may sometimes get caught out because Facebook presents things that you weren't expecting, things that you'd forgotten that you'd posted, they're pulled together when someone else does something. So your visibility isn't always in your control. But all the time, we're negotiating against and with others who are trying to make us more or less visible. This idea of being more or less visible, I think, is a really useful one, rather than talking about privacy. Tonight, I'm going to say very, very little about privacy, because I think privacy is all bound up in rights. It doesn't really work for groups. It's very difficult to get privacy from the Hebrew Bible from the New Testament. There are some things you can do. But I think this idea of invisibility, the responsibility, the skill of, if you want to say, in other words, how we use our privacy, how we manage our privacy, how we manage how we are visible, vis-a-vis -vis the government, vis-a-vis -vis other groups, our friends, that, I think, is a much more accessible way of bridging this gap between the Old Testament, New Testament, and the present world. Because... It's an ancient skill. People in all sorts of social settings have managed how they are invisible. There is invisibility before God. There's an intriguing passage in Deuteronomy that is worth taking just a minute or so to think about. Because it makes us stop and question some of our assumptions about biblical times and what might have been understood about what it means to say about God seeing and us being visible before God, or even being invisible before God. The context in the passage in Deuteronomy I'm going to think about is in a series of regulations pertaining to holiness. There's neighborliness, there's helping someone get his ox back on his feet, there's forbidding of cross-dressing, there's building a safety barrier on your roof, there's the death, death sentence for adultery. But tucked away there, there are some instructions about a military camp. I think it tells us one of the most interesting things about invisibility that we perhaps can find in the Old Testament. You shall have a designated area outside the camp to which you shall go. Deuteronomy 23. With your utensils you shall have a trowel. When you relieve yourself outside you shall dig a hole with it and then cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God travels along with your camp to save you, and to hand over your enemies to you, therefore your camp must be holy, so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. Naturally, there are good issues of hygiene here, but that's actually besides the point. 
God, it would appear from this passage in Deuteronomy, is not an all-seeing God. There are areas upon which God's gaze does not fall. God sees what happens within the camp, but by going outside the camp to perform a natural bodily function, the soldier avoids the divine gaze. God doesn't see everything. Now, we could juxtapose that with the very familiar Psalm 139, which offers a comfort and challenge of never being out of God's sight. O Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. So there's something very complex going on here in the Hebrew Bible. We have texts developing in different genres, in contexts, and in time periods. And it's not profitable, I think, to take a simplistic approach and find a supposed conflict between these two understandings of God's gaze. What I think we have here in Deuteronomy 22 and Psalm 139 are two different ways of talking about God's gaze. There's God's cultic gaze. It's all about what's clean and unclean. And then there's an existential understanding of God's gaze. God sees, God searches, God knows. He discerns our thoughts from afar. There's something really quite significant about the language of how God sees being a language of cultic practice. And there's a separate language about God seeing that is bound up with devotion, with an existential experience of being consoled, of being seen, of being known through and through by God. They're not necessarily in conflict They're just helping us, I think, to understand there are different ways of conceptualizing the idea when we talk about God seeing, when we talk about being visible or invisible before God. We can be visible or invisible, and more or less visible, not only before God, but before other people. We stop and think about it. The personal narrative of Moses is not only a story of surveillance, But it's a story of invisibility. He's hidden in bulrushes by Hebrew midwives. He's discovered by the daughter of Pharaoh. He's made more visible by the daughter of Pharaoh. He's brought up in the royal household. Couldn't really get more visible than that. But Moses' true origins are rendered invisible. The question of his identity emerges later as a cause for him to flee to Midian. So we could find countless other stories about people being more or less visible before others. The brothers of Joseph are another example. Let me turn to invisibility in the New Testament. The invisibility of God. God managing God's visibility. I think that for Jesus, there were two main groups towards which he practiced his own invisibility. He managed his visibility in social settings. These were the authorities and they were his disciples along with the general public. Let me start with the authorities. From the time of his birth, Jesus was caught up in the complex process of negotiated visibility before the Jewish leadership. Much of the infancy narrative about Jesus is him being made invisible in the flight to Egypt, so the Holy Family are kept safe from King Herod. Once his ministry begins to unfold, Jesus' table fellowship is, I think, a good example of his invisibility in practice. Here's one vis-a-vis the Pharisees. It's from Matthew 9. As he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus was exercising his invisibility vis-a-vis the Pharisees. He was also exercising his invisibility vis-a-vis the Romans. This is the complement to his being under their surveillance. It becomes acute when during his passion, Jesus moves from adept management of his visibility as he's moving around the country and choosing his moments to highlight his presence in Jerusalem, Jesus gives over the power of control of his invisibility into the hands of the Romans. The Romans can now make him more or less visible as they wish. Jesus surrenders 
rights, if we want to use those terms, Jesus surrenders the control of his own visibility. His trial before Pilate is not simply about Jesus being physically visible to him, but Jesus' core identity, at least in Roman minds, is becoming more visible. The plaque above his head on the cross, King of the Jews, is the ostensible reason for his execution as a political prisoner. In the New Testament, there's the invisibility of people before other people. Jesus takes particular people to task for practicing their piety, to quote Matthew 6, before men. The Corinthians were, of course, agonizing in the marketplace, not agonizing over whether to buy organic beef or not. Theirs was the dilemma of whether to buy meat that had been sacrificed to idols, 1 Corinthians 8. From a strictly spiritual perspective, this was no consequence because idols are nothing. The problem arises because immature Christians observe these purchases and may have not reached that theological appreciation. The immature Christian is misreading the situation as an endorsement of idols. And here we have a clear ethical angle on invisibility. The mature Christian has nothing to hide. The mature Christian can go to the marketplace and buy meat sacrificed to idols, but her visibility in the marketplace vis-a-vis immature believers, that creates a problem for her. The Apostle Paul's injunction is to consider if the immature believer is observing and defer to their perspective by declining to purchase. So I think we can say here that our invisibility, how we practice our visibility under surveillance of all sorts, is entwined with the visibility of other people. Invisibility is not this personal thing like rights of privacy. Invisibility is a social responsibility as well as it is a social skill. How we manifest and manage our own visibility has impact upon other people. And the New Testament at least makes us conscious of our invisibility and the practice of that having repercussions for other people. We can think of invisibility of people before God. I've already mentioned the wrong negotiation of invisibility by those who are praying ostentatiously on a street corner. When it comes to invisibility before God, there are a number of probably quite familiar dimensions. God sees when we pray in secret. We're encouraged that God knows what we need before we ask. And that has implications for forgiveness. We need to forgive other people before we can be forgiven ourselves. God knows everything, including our heart. Our Heavenly Father knows that we need food, drink, clothing, and daily necessities of living. There are no surprises here in terms of being visible before God. But there are some, I think, strange legacies of cultic practice and purity in the early church communities. Christians are being taught that women must veil in church. Why? Because of the angels. Women's sartorial visibility, not wearing jewellery, is to be controlled, 1 Peter 3. And of course, there's the necessity of women being silent in church as a demonstration of the created order in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, disentangling cultural and religious sensitivities is a rather thankless task because they are so interwoven. But what we do have is a community that when gathered intentionally for worship makes itself visible to God in a particular way. Now here, that particular way involves making women less visible. And not only to the men who were fellow worshippers, but in this frame of thinking, they were made less visible to spiritual beings, to God. So we actually have something very complex going on in the New Testament about people's invisibility before God and before one another. I'm using this concept of invisibility because it's about human relationships. It's about how we engage with one another. It's about how we have responsibility not only for our own visibility and invisibility, but we have responsibilities for others. What we do ourselves has impact upon others. How we manage our invisibility has impact and implications for others. And that brings me to this final section, surveillance from the cross. Some implications. 
I've mentioned this word solidarity a few times this evening. Christ was one who knew what it was to be under surveillance himself. He is in solidarity, I want to suggest, with all those who are unjustly treated, who are marginalized, who are oppressed, whose invisibility is controlled unjustly by surveillance technologies. It is Christ's solidarity with them that is our solidarity with those for whom surveillance is both disproportionate and unjust. There's something about solidarity under surveillance that's quite surprising. The famous picture of the division of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 is shocking precisely because those under surveillance are caught doing good. And they don't even know that it was good done to Christ. It's this vision of future judgment that's part of what lies behind this theological suggestion I want to make of solidarity with those who, like Christ, are under unjust surveillance. Taking that perspective, it's those marginalized under surveillance that are through his solidarity, also Christ now under surveillance. Let me amplify the text. I was under unjust surveillance, and you advocated for me. Lord, when did we see you under unjust surveillance and advocate for you? As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I think that parable can give us an access into what it means to express solidarity with those who are unju under unjust surveillance. Because Christ says, it's me. In them, I am under unjust surveillance. It means that we need to be suspicious towards power. How much do we trust and how much ought we be suspicious of surveillance? More accurately, how do we know when to trust and when to be suspicious of those who deploy everyday surveillance towards us? The question is equally valid when we are the ones using surveillance technologies in our professional lives. When are we to be trusted? And when are we to be viewed with rightful suspicion? I don't think we can answer those questions in general terms, but it has to be in specific cases. But we need to develop our critical capacities to be more aware and to be more suspicious of the power of surveillance. One of the principal difficulties here is that we're often encountering surveillance as data gathering, systems that are at least one stage removed from human intervention. More important still, those systems treat us as sources of data, as mines of information from which valuable data can be extracted, processed, and monetized. I think Christians would likely want to join others who make a significant difference between data and knowledge between information and between deep relational knowing. Quaker Rachel Moores talks about relational knowledge. She wants us to reconfigure this idea of knowledge and information. Information is abstracted from a relationship with the one who is known. This is the significance of, or neglecting the significance of the person as a bearer of value. Someone just becomes a data source from which data is mined, data is scraped. Instead, we need to think of relationship and knowledge going together. We may be able to gather information, but it's not to be misunderstood as knowledge. When we think of how God knows us, God does not gather information about us. God doesn't gather data about us. God knows us, and God's knowing us is always in the context of the covenant, God's promises to us. So God knows us. God has relational knowledge of us. And I think this idea of relational knowledge, always keeping the relationship important, not abstracting people, not turning people into data sources, that's the way that we can recontextualize the abstracted person from whom data is scraped. We and others are not mere sources of data. We're not taken away from our context. Maybe that's what corporations, what states want to do to us. 
We want to treat us as sources of data. But as Christians, we want to keep pulling back and saying that's not information. Don't confuse it with information. It's not about relationship. Relationship and information go together. Relationship and knowledge, rather, go together. Decontextualized data, that's a misunderstanding of what it means to know one another. How then are Christians to respond? I think we should be valuing surveillance.